Welcome to What the Bible Says TV broadcast. I'm David Barton with the Gatlinburg Church of Christ. Each week, our minister, Roger Comstock, will share with you a message from God's Word. We welcome your comments and your questions. I will be back at the close of today's program with additional information. And now, here's Roger Comstock and What the Bible Says. Keep in mind that the things that are stated in this book are true in that they happened to Solomon, but they're not true as far as righteousness based on the truths of God's word and what is moral and right and just and holy. Uh, he acknowledges that um, and doesn't, uh, may, he doesn't uh, pretend that, uh, that these things are godly uh, ventures, but uh, that he is searching for something that uh, is not within his grasp. Uh, to find, at least in this time. Keep in mind that Solomon was likely the most w wealthy man, the wealthiest man on the face of the earth, quite possibly. Uh, we, the, we, there are a lot of numbers we've thrown around, uh, extraordinary uh, um, wealth that he possessed, and, and even on a, a regular basis, maybe even an annual basis, literally millions of dollars, as we would understand it, that came into him as king of Israel. At that time, again, possibly the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, as this was a time of, uh, by and large, a time of peace uh, as compared to uh, the days of his father. Um, as you know, David was a, a man of blood and thus uh, a warrior. That's not the case with Solomon. And so uh, look, uh, let's be looking at uh, the fourth chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes simply means the preacher. And so if you'll see throughout the book, you'll see the phrase, the preacher, or that terminology, that's, that's Solomon. He's referring to himself. Some believe, and probably correctly so, some believe that he wrote this as a textbook to his sons that would follow, uh, basically a textbook of things you should not do. And, uh, and so it certainly could uh, fit that purpose for each of us in our day-to-day -day lives as well. I've divided this chapter a little bit uh, but uh, for, for study purposes, but overall the book, uh, this one chapter basically is about disappointments in life and things that he sees and observes that are disappointing to him. As we read, I'll be reading from the New King James translation, and I'm going to back up and begin at the last verse of chapter 3 because I think uh, the thought continues here as, uh, as we read and studied from uh, the third chapter last week um, during, our, during our lesson time. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'll begin here at verse 22 and then we'll move in to chapter 4. Solomon writes, So I perce perceived that nothing is better than that, that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? And he talked about that and uh, about uh, leaving an inheritance and so forth and how that inheritance would be squandered by those who are the heirs. That, and you know, people tend to be that way. When you don't work hard for something, you tend to not value it like maybe we ought to. And so... Uh, that's, uh, I believe, a principle that's true in every time frame, every age, every generation. And so he, he says, he, he says, why shouldn't I just go ahead and enjoy the things that I've worked for? And we'll see that a little bit, some of that same tone here in, in this, uh, this fourth chapter. Let's look at the first uh, three verses as that thought continues. He says, then I returned and considered all the, all the oppression um, that is done under the sun. And look, the tears of the oppressed, uh, but they have no comforter. On the side of their oppressors, there is power, but they have no comforter. Therefore, I praised the dead who were already dead, more than, those, more than the living who, who are still alive, yet better than both is he who has never existed, who, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again, notice in this, this short section, 
uh, he begins at the very first in verse 1 and says, under the sun. And then at the, at the, at the close of verse 3, he also says, under the sun. So he's talking about, he's not talking about moral uh, religious integrity or anything like that. He's talking about life as, from a human perspective um, and uh, as it would be uh, on earth among humans and so forth. And largely by human standards. Notice he, he expresses uh, some somewhat compassion for those who are oppressed. Um, I, I couldn't help but think as I was uh, reading and rereading this, uh, this passage, I couldn't think, help but think of our present days. There are a lot of people who are very distressed and maybe we could even say oppressed because of the restrictions that have been put on us by the government to, to try to contain this, uh, this horrible virus. But, uh, but those who are oppressed maybe because they have the virus or maybe people who are suffering that uh, are feeling the effects of this isolation. Um, God, and we'll see a little bit later in this chapter, God made us to be people, uh, people of uh, social uh, people is what I'm trying to say, that we're to be people people. And, and so here he, uh, he, he expresses this concern for those who are oppressed and he recognizes those who are the oppressors and that the oppressors don't do anything. They're the ones in power and they don't do anything to comfort, comfort those who are oppressed. And he comes to, just from that, this little section, he comes to a rather uh, somewhat startling maybe co uh, conclusion um, in just this section. There at verse two, he says, I praise the one who's already dead. Um, you know, this, even though we'll see similar statements like this throughout the book, um, I don't believe for a moment that Solomon had any kind of a death wish or, or that he was suicidal or anything like that, I don't believe. But he recognizes those who are dead don't have to endure some of the things we see on this earth. Um, maybe they did in their time, but there is one sense that maybe he sees that Death is, uh, is somewhat a relief from, uh, from those who are, as he says, still living. And then he says, better yet are the ones who've never even been born. I, you know, as we talked a little bit this morning at the beginning of my lesson, as I ranted a little bit about what's going on in our world, uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, we in our comfort, we are the most comfortable people, especially here in this country. We're the most comfortable people ever. And we have uh, greater prosperity than any people probably ever, as far as we in general, uh, overall as a nation. And yet this is also a time in my estimation of maybe, at least in my lifetime, the greatest evil that I can remember ever. We see the, uh, see the, 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 the promotion of abortion as a as a, a, a viable alternative to uh, to uh, the pregnancy that uh, that maybe maybe exists, we see uh, homosexuality and same sex marriage as as it's rampant in our world and and accepted by the majority it seems and and uh, certainly by many of the leaders of our nation and so forth that these things uh, that both the the, the uh, the, the killing of unborn babies and, and uh, the same-sex marriage and homosexuality, all, I believe, are abominations before God. And yet we who try to stand for what's good and right and moral are mocked and ridiculed and even tried to suppress uh, our teaching and, and, uh, and uh, speaking uh, the truth of God's Word on these matters. You say, preacher, well, why do you pick on those two? Well, those are two prominent evils in our world in this generation. Murder and stealing and all of those things have been around for ages and ages and they are just as wrong, just as sinful. But in this present age, we have been plagued uh, by the, the horrible dec 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 decline in the morality of our nation by these two particular sins. And I believe that uh, we as a, as a nation will pay a horrible price for the barbaric methods that are used and the, the, the ungodly, immoral, evil things that are practiced in our world. Um, and so he says, he'd been better if he'd never been born. That one who's never been born hasn't seen the evil of this world. And you know, I guess there is one uh, uh, glimmer of, uh, of good even in the horrible, uh, horrible killing of the unborn. 
that I believe with all my heart that those unborn babies have a, are at, at ease in residence uh, with our Lord um, as, they, uh, as they will enjoy an eternity uh, with Him because they are without sin, of course. Let me move along. I'll get distracted too easily. Verse 4. Again, he says, <clears throat> excuse me, again, I, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is envied by his neighbor. This also is vanity and grasping for wind. The fool folds his hands and, and, and consumes his own flesh. Better a handful, better a handful of, with quietness than both hands full, together with toil and grasping for wind. A um, couple of things kind of interesting in this uh, very, that really uh, touch in, in our lives, I think, very directly. We have an expression. We talk about uh, uh, keeping up with the Joneses, and uh, we all understand what that means, that we see uh, the neighbor down the street gets a new car, and we think we have to have a new car, or they add on to their house and add another bedroom, or maybe expand their garage to, to accommodate their new cars, and boy, we got to try to keep up with them. And a lot of people have worked themselves to death and worked themselves into poverty trying to keep up with someone that is above, maybe above their uh, income standard. But notice he says, the, the one who works hard, there are those also, and you know as well as I, there are those who stand back and, and, and envy the things that they accomplish, and yet they're not willing to do the work that that individual uh, has done. I may have used this example before, so bear with me, but... Uh, I remember a long time ago, uh, as a kid growing up, uh, we often would see Liberace, the great pianist, um, uh, perform on television in all his extravagant uh, stuff. And uh, I don't certainly would never condone uh, his lifestyle, but uh, he was uh, one of the great musicians, uh, uh, at least in my lifetime. And I remember he uh, supposedly to told the story that a woman came to him one day and said, uh, uh, Liberace, I would do anything in the world to be able to play the piano like you do. And uh, he said, uh, would you be willing to practice 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day to accomplish that? Well, see, he had paid a price. He had paid a price by, to, to, uh, uh, to craft his, his talent and to fine-tune his talent by practice and practice and practice. And people envied him, mocked him, made fun of him, uh, but no one could take away from him his great talent to, to play the piano. And so it's like that in a lot of things. People say, well, I wish I had what old so-and-so had, but they're not willing to... Uh, pardon the expression, but to get off their backside and go to work and try to accomplish the things that those people have. And he says, uh, this is also vanity and grasping for wind, that uh, those things certainly should not be, but sadly in our world, that's the way it is. He says, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Uh, it doesn't mean that he's cannibalistic at all. It simply means he uses up all of everything he's got and trying to keep up with the one who has worked to earn. They, they want to do it the easy way, and so they spend everything they've got, use everything that they, available to them, and they consume themselves on trying to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. And he says, uh, uh, th this person, he says, it's better, uh, better a handful of quietness than both hands full together with toil and, and grasping for wind. And so we need to keep our perspective right and not envy our neighbor and not to, not to uh, um, uh, be, be upset or jealous of the things that they have. Um, and uh, and uh, we, uh, I think the implication here as well, too, that God expects us to be people who work in whatever profession. I used to do construction work and, uh, for many, many years, and I don't mind telling you, physically it's a whole lot harder than preaching. But uh, uh, mentally, uh, I guarantee you, preaching is much more difficult. Let me move along to verse 7. He says, Then I returned and saw vanity under the sun. There, there is one alone without companion. He, he has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all his labors, nor, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks 
For whom do I toil and, and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. Um, you know, as I said a moment ago, God made us to be social beings. In the beginning, he saw Adam by himself and he said, if I could paraphrase, this is not good. I didn't make uh, Adam to be by himself. And so he created from, uh, from the, the body of, of Adam, he created Eve. And so God intended us to be social beings. I recognize that probably all of us from time to time like a little bit of quiet time and like to be away from people in general. Uh, and, and there are also times that uh, we long to be with people. I, I mentioned uh, to someone yesterday that uh, uh, you know, I, I miss our crowds of people. I miss greeting our visitors. I miss our local folks that we so dearly love. And, and I miss them. And uh, that's because that's the way God made us. And, uh, and certainly, as he speaks here, it is sad that he sees one who has no one. He has no heir, no son or brother, he says, to, to leave his things to. And, and yet he keeps on working and working and working. Maybe we would call that person an, a, a, a workaholic. He says, nor is his eye satisfied with his riches. He sees all that he's accumulated because of his hard work, and he has no one to share it with or leave it to, and so it just accumulates. And so for some people, it comes into their mind that I, I just need to build more and more and more and more. And you remember as we studied in chapter 3, he saw the, Solomon saw the folly of that as well, that those who would come along as heirs, if there are any, that uh, they would not appreciate the work that was given. And he says, so, so from whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? Why shouldn't I just enjoy this stuff that is the result of my hard work? And Solomon would agree with that. But he says also that the idea of just physical things and striving to accumulate all of that, he says, is vanity. And notice he says, and a grave misfortune. Now verse 9. He says, two are better than one because they have, they have a good reward for their labor. Let me, well, I'll, let me finish this section and I'll come back. Uh, he says, for if they, if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. Um, again, if two lie together, they will, they will keep warm. But, uh, but how, can one, how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord sh is not quickly broken. Uh, a couple of things of interest. One, you know, uh, one of the expressions that we use and um, as we, uh, several things in this particular section remind me of some wedding ceremonies that I performed and counseling with uh, uh, young couples, or not necessarily young couples, but couples who are, are fixing to marry. And uh, to begin with, notice he says, two is better than one. And in, sometimes in wedding vows, we say that the joys, when there are two, the, the joys are doubled. And when there are sorrows, those sorrows are shared as well. So there's no question, uh, I think he's referring to those kinds of relationships. And, and you know, when, when you do good, when, uh, when either one of the, in the marriage relationship, either one uh, um, has some kind of a, a, an accomplishment of some kind, maybe a promotion at work, or maybe some uh, special reward, or uh, um, acknowledgement of some kind, a, a certificate, or, or a plaque, or something like that, it's all the better when you can share it with your partner. Makes, it, uh, makes the, the labor all worthwhile. And notice he says, and I, I couldn't help but think of uh, as we were remodeling our house, um, uh, I found that it, my uh, construction experience, um, even though my brain still knew what to do, my body wasn't able to do the things I did back when I was 25 and so, and, and working construction. And I, and I couldn't help but think of that as he says, if you fall down, if there's two of you, you got somebody to help you up. And it really is sad when, when you're alone and you fall and there's no one there to help. He says in verse 11 and 12, this is very interesting because I also use this, I use this in wedding ceremonies, but I also use this in, in premarital counseling. 
as he says uh, again, two, uh, if two lie together, uh, they will keep, uh, keep uh, each other warm and so forth. But then verse 12, he says, though one may be overpowered by another, uh, another individual, not, uh, not uh, your partner, but by another individual completely, he says, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. But notice then he says, and a three co threefold cord is not quickly broken. I often draw a, a, a diagram or a, a triangle as I'm teaching uh, young uh, people fixing to marry, and I use the same triangle in teaching uh, about marriage in, in my preaching, but uh, I use this example because with the triangle, if you can picture in your mind, and I should, maybe should have inclu included that uh, diagram, but if you can picture in your mind a triangle and picture husband and wife at the bottom corners of that triangle and God at the top of the triangle, and the reality is if both at the bottom, the husband and wife, if both of them are drawn closer to God, they are automatically drawn closer to one another. And in doing so, the, a three-fold cord is not quickly broken. And I absolutely believe with all of my heart that if we'll make God the center of our marriages, make Him the center of our lives, our marriages and our family, uh, we can withstand things that... Uh, we might not even realize we're able to withstand because as he said, a three cord, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. We need God in our lives. Verse 13. But a poor and wise youth, uh, better a poor and wise youth than an old foolish king who will be, who would be, who will be admonished no more. But, but he comes out of a prison to be king, although he was born poor in his kingdom. I saw all the living who walk under the sun. They were with the, they were with the second youth who stands in his place. There was no end of all the people over whom he was made king. Yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and grasping for wind. Um, interesting statement. You know, Solomon wrote to, wrote to the majority of the Proverbs. And in addition to the Proverbs recorded, wrote to many, many others that are not recorded. Uh, wish they were. But this is somewhat of a proverb at the beginning there of verse 13. Better a poor, uh, wise youth than an old foolish king who will not be admonished. He won't listen to anybody. And so it's better for a poor, wise youth than an old foolish king. And he goes on, apparently, we don't know, the, verses 14 and, uh, well, verse 14 in particular, uh, verse 14 in particular, is kind of hard to understand, but it seems as though it must have been that Solomon knew of some situation where there was someone like uh, that he describes here. I don't think it's referring to him or his family or anything like that, maybe a neighboring nation or something, but someone who became a king who was highly unlikely to be king, a, a poor person, or maybe someone who'd been in prison, and all of a sudden, for whatever the circumstances may be, that person becomes king. And notice 15, in verse 15, he says, And I saw all the living who walk under the sun, and they were with the second, uh, second youth who stands in his place. There was no end to all the people over whom he was made king, and yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and grasping for wind. You know, in whatever, whatever you try to accomplish, um, if you work, uh, I, uh, uh, this afternoon I spent a few moments and I watched, I watched our Vice President Pence give the inaugural address, uh, inaugural address um, excuse me, the graduation address at, uh, at the Naval Academy, or excuse me, not the Naval Academy, I'll get it right in a moment, at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Um, it was interesting, none of the family of the graduates were allowed to be there because of this uh, social distancing, but they had the graduates spread out all over the football field, a beautiful design laid out with six, uh, I'm sure were about six feet apart, each one of them. And the, just a very, uh, very pretty the way they had it all laid out. 
But it, it was very interesting that as he, he acknowledged the, the accomplishments of those young people and uh, the great choice they've made to be servants uh, to our nation and to protect our nation as they go on into uh, the Air Force, uh, the, Air Force uh, um, the military branch of our, our Air Force. Um, but you know, the one he, and, and I, I, I didn't do this on purpose, but he named one who I understand was dis, designated as exemplar, exemplar, or that's probably not the right pronunciation, but the one who was at the top of the class, apparently. And you know, that's only been about uh, probably less than an hour ago that I watched it, and I don't remember the young man's name who was the top of his class. The days will pass, and generations will pass, and People will forget who, uh, who Mike Pence is uh, at this time as vice president. Some uh, in the years to come, eventually some will not recognize uh, um, uh, Mr. Trump as uh, even acknowledge him as, as our president. Some are already doing that. And so wherever, whatever field you're in, you can work to get to the top. And bottom line, we'll all be somewhat forgotten. Uh, you could work and accomplish and be the greatest preacher ever in the history of the world. I don't know how you measure that and so on, but a few generations down the road and you'd be forgotten. We pray they wouldn't forget what you preach, but they'd maybe forget the person. And in every walk of life, you, you work and you work and you work to accomplish things. And, and here as he defines a, a young man who came out of prison and became a king, did great things apparently, but... He's quickly forgotten. And maybe uh, when you quit padding someone's pocket or, or maybe if you cut off the benefits the government gives to a certain group of people and this and that, um, attitudes change pretty quickly when you hit people's pocketbooks or when you quit providing them the benefits. You know, there is a, uh, there is a, a sign that you can see in the national park uh, whenever our national park reopens. And there's a sign you see different places that will say, don't feed the bears because they become dependent on human beings. Well, the same principle applies in life in general, whether it's with an employer, an, an employee who slacks in his job and, and gets away with it, or if it's people who are physically capable of working and don't want to work, would rather, rather live on a government handout. You take that little bit away, and just like the bear in the park, you try to snatch that food out of his mouth, and he's probably going to get, uh, get ill with you. Well, people are the same way. And they may pat you on the back today, but they may, uh, they not, they may not sing your praise tomorrow. And he concludes this chapter with these words, Surely this also is vanity and grasping for wind. I want to close, as I did last week, by jumping to the end of the story. I, I don't, I'm not giving it all away, but the, this certainly is a great conclusion. In pursuing all these, uh, these less than noble things, these uh, cravings of the human body and, and uh, the fleshly carnal desires and so forth that uh, Solomon is pursuing to find contentment and, and fulfillment in life. But he does get his head right in the end. And he writes these words. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so even though some of these things, if you, if you just pull out a, a verse or a section out of the book of Ecclesiastes, you can make it say some things and you could even pretend that the Bible says, well, it's okay to do this. Solomon isn't saying it's okay. He's telling of his life experience in pursuing things that are not okay. And certainly there ought to be warning there for you and I. So take heed. The conclusion of the matter is to fear God, respect, have God in, in awe, hold Him in awe, and keep His commandments. It's what God intended us to do. It's what He made us to do, um, created us to do, I guess would be a better way to say it because we will give an account. Because we are weak and fallible, God sent His Son to die for us. Uh, but we have to submit to Him. We have to keep His commandments. We have to surrender to Him. But if we'll do that, if we'll surrender to the will of the Lord and uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, then He will 
Save Thank you for watching What the Bible Says. If you have comments or questions about today's message, write to us at Church of Christ, P.O. Box 361, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, 37738. If you would like a free online Bible correspondence course, send an email to Bible Study at GatlinburgChurchofChrist.com. We invite you to join us in person on Sunday mornings for Bible study at 9 o'clock and worship at 10 o'clock. We meet again on Sunday at 6 p.m. for evening worship. On Wednesdays, we meet at 7 p.m. for midweek Bible study. We're located at 414 Trinity Lane near downtown Gatlinburg. For more information,